this has been, for me, a, a series that has had all sorts of really meaningful moments along the way as we've been just to kind of give a foundation for the, the conversation this morning. We have been, over the last few weeks, talking about what it looks like to embrace our family values. Not talking just nuclear family but in, in that kind of idea, but this idea of who is it that we're created to be? What should our community, our, our group of people, what should we be marked by? And so what we've used as a framework for understanding that is, is a section in 2 Corinthians where Paul describes to the church what, what their lives should look like and to understand that, that values matter, right? What we believe, what we take hold of, the things that we've allowed to become, the things that, that drive us, that values matter, but they really only matter when we're actually applying them to the act of living, right? When we actually have those be expressed into our lives in the way that, that we actually behave and act and treat each other and relate with, with the world around us. And so for me, as we've talked family, it's been a real privilege. The, the last couple of weeks, we have gotten to spend time with my parents. They were able to drive up, or, or not drive up, fly up and, and visit us and spend some time together and just be reminded, for me, just to be reminded of family and the values and the way that those play out in stories and experiences and all those kinds of things. So there's just, to me, it's just a, it's been a beautiful experience leading up to this moment uh, as we talk Father's Day and all those kinds of things. But recognizing we're talking values, we're talking family values and we've been talking over the last few weeks, we talked about hope. And if you remember what we said when we talked about this was hope is, is rooted in the past, but it's oriented towards the future. So we look and we say, so God has done for us this thing in the past, but, but what it does is it, it's not just that we dwell in the past and dwell in the thing that was done for us. That becomes the foundation for our future understanding. So we look toward the future, but with confidence because of what God has done. That's hope. That's a family value most appropriately and most best understood when it's actually applied to the act of living. What does it look like to be a people who live in hope? And then we talked faith. Faith is, is rooted in the future, right? So, so hope is, is rooted in the past and, and, and looks to the future. Faith is rooted in the future, believing that what God has said would happen will happen, that the promises will be fulfilled. But then it changes the present, right? The here and now where, where we actually live our lives, where we actually have to sort these things out. And so we look and we say, so, so how do we live now given, given what the promises are for the future, the faith that we have about what will happen should impact the here and now. And then this week, as, as Paul is continuing this conversation with the church in Corinth, describing the values that, that should drive them as a, as a community of Jesus followers, he talks about endurance. And we've if we understand it properly, endurance connects the past, the present, and the future. It's the thing that, that, that brings all of it together because it says, so, so this is what has happened. And so this is how we live now because of what will be, right? So, so endurance says it's, it's not just, or to, to understand and to put a fine point on it, endurance that we're talking about here is not just simply getting through hard things, hunkering down and surviving the, the difficult things that come our way, not just showing God how tough we are and impressing him with our resilience and our persistence and all those kinds of things. Endurance is saying, this is the race that has been marked for me. This is the goal and the bullseye of my life, and I'm going to run to that thing, regardless of what circumstances look like around me, regardless of, of the things that I can't make sense of and the, and the kinds of things that happen to my reputation because all of a sudden I'm living in a different kind of way. That endurance doesn't just simply hang on. And the kind of endurance that we're talking about isn't just impressing God with our resilience. It's us saying, this is what we're called to. And so we're going to endure our way through it, right? We're going to run the race that's been marked for us. I talked about COVID last week, and I'm going to talk about it for just a second. Again, I have to like take a few weeks off where we don't even pre like talk about it at all. But one of the things that emerged as, as part of the language that we use as a people that, for me, I hadn't really thought too much about this particular term until it became a, a reason why people were wear, still continuing to wear masks and different decisions were being made, this idea of asymptomatic, and where we could, could have an infection, and yet it doesn't show up in any kind of meaningful way where we'd actually realize that it's even happening. Right? This became a cultural conversation about, about what we should do with those situations where we have the infection, but there's no symptoms, no evidence of any kind that, that there's an actual something that's actually happening in us. And what Paul seems to be describing as he's talking to the church in Corinth is this reality that without endurance, without actually applying to the act of living the things that, that God is teaching us, the values that come our way, then what can happen is, is we can end up living in an asymptomatic kind of way, 
where there is no external evidence, there is no evidence at all that, that there is anything that's happening below the surface. Endurance is what keeps the, what's happening in us from, from being asymptomatic, where it actually shows up in the way that we make decisions, in the way that we relate to each other, in the way that we actually live our lives. And so Paul, as he's writing to the church in Corinth, this is the second letter, 2 Corinthians, he's writing to the church, church in Corinth, and he's addressing this tendency that they have. You'll see it show up in all sorts of different ways as, as you read the letters that he, he writes to the church where he's describing this tendency to say, we want the, the things of God, the grace of God, the, the, the status of salvation. But when things get difficult, when it starts to look like there might be some things that come our way that are less than ideal, when it starts to look like circumstances might become more difficult, that, that that's not the version of following Jesus that, that the, the Corinthian church, at least in part, that, Je- that, that Paul seems to be dealing with. This human tendency to, to want to disregard the parts of the story that require something of us. And so Paul has been away from the church in Corinth. He was part of the team that, that founded the, the church there. And then as he's re-entering back into this community, he finds that, that it's not that they're resistant necessarily to the things he has to say, but they're actually stepping away from him because his very life bears the marks of a life lived in obedience to God. So he has suffered. He has been mistreated. He's been persecuted. He's been imprisoned. He's, he's had to go without. He's, he's experienced all sorts of hardships. And the church in, in Corinth seems to, as we see this, the, the letter that Paul is writing, that, that they're living with this tension where they seem to think that there may be some other option for the way that they live their lives. So Paul says, you have to look at me. Look at what I've experienced. And there's this human tendency that says where, where there is suffering and hardship that, that we kind of want to tend to keep our distance. And Paul says, look at the, the way that I've lived. Look at what has been true of my life and the way that it's all fit together and the way that, that God's grace at work in me has led me into circumstances that, that, that might be the kinds of things that you want to avoid. So much so that, that even as I'm in relationship with you, that you're keeping your distance from me in some ways, maybe because my life reminds you of what your life might look like if you really leaned in or if you really took hold of this, if you really started to allow this to affect the way that you live your lives. So Paul is talking about this work of, of reconciling the, this Corinthian church with, with him and with the people that are around him and, and with God and with the, the, the world around them that, that he's doing this, this conversation, trying to help them understand the way life should look. And so it's into that reality, and that, that pulling away that Paul is sensing, that, that picture that, that the Corinthian church seems to have of, of this life that, that doesn't require suffering and those kinds of things, that, that Paul is writing this letter saying, let the values that we have, the things that we should take hold of because of what Jesus has done, let that affect the act of living. And so in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul writes this, he says, as God's co-workers... So Paul talking about himself and the people that are traveling with him. He says, as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. And this isn't necessarily a, a statement of where like, salvation didn't do its work, where there's not a persistence and those kinds of things. But he's saying, so, so, so don't receive, first of all, receive, but, but don't receive it in vain in the sense that there's no, there's no forward progress. There's no growth. There's, there's, there's no movement forward in light of and in response to what God has done. That as Paul is writing, and we see it th- show up throughout the, the letter, that he writes that, that, that grace that has been given to this church, to these people, has, hasn't led them to live differently, really. And so Paul says, so, so what has been done for you should change the way you live as you live in grateful response to the, way that, to, to the things that God has done for you. Grace hasn't led them to live differently in response to what has been done for them. And it could be, there's a few things as Paul writes and you see it show up in his writings that it could be that they've been influenced by people who have, who have made promises about life lived with God that, that's easy, that doesn't require as much from them, that isn't going to create tensions in their world, that, that isn't going to have, force them to have to make decisions about the things that they value and what they hold on to and what they let go of, that, that's really an, an easier way forward that there's the influence of those who are, who are offering or seem to be describing an easier way. It could be that, that they have a lack of gratitude for what's been done for them. That somewhere along the line, they, they forgot the significance of, of the grace that was extended to them. Where they were when God met them and what God did for them through Jesus Christ and, and all those kinds of things. And, and so instead of responding in, in gratitude, which would affect and, and re- give them a different way of living, that they've just simply received it and it's become almost an entitlement that they've, that they've accepted. And Paul says, so, 
So we've got to figure out a different way. So what we can't do, and again, the foundation for the rest of the conversation that, that he's having with them in this section of scripture, he says, so, so don't receive the grace of God in vain. It should change you, right? It should be expressed in the way that you live your life. Paul would have this be a consistent theme in lots of different conversations with lots of different churches as, as he would go about his ministry on earth. That he wrote in, in or it was recorded a, a conversation in Acts chapter 20 where Luke is recording the, Paul's conversation with the leaders in the church in Ephesus. I'm just going to read this so we can hear the kinds of things that he says to other churches. Verse 18 of Acts chapter 20. When they arrived, he said to them, now this is Paul speaking, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came in, into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. He says, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And then now we talk the, the evidence of, of a life well lived. He says, and now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. He says in verse 23, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Paul says, my life is only meaningful in the sense that, in, in the ways that, that God is able to use it to bring light to this world. Right, to, to look and say, I'm going to go to cities, I'm going to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit to go to places and respond in obedience to the mission that's been in place in front of me. But I'm going to suffer. And I know that the only confidence that I really seem to have is that, is that I know that when I go into these places, I'm going to experience hardship. I'm going to experience pushback and imprisonment and all these kinds of things. But he says, this is where my life is only meaningful is when I'm actually being used in the mission that God has placed in front of me. He says, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. He says, to tell the story of Jesus, to, to tell the story of God at work for me, in me, and through me. So then 2 Corinthians chapter 6, again, back now continuing this conversation with the Corinthian church, Paul then quotes Isaiah 49, 8. He says, for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now Paul is saying, now I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. That Paul is taking this ancient promise, this promise that has been given to, to people years and years and years before this conversation is happening. He says, there is this moment that we've been waiting for, this, this moment that, that is described as the day of salvation. And Paul says, there is an urgency of here and now to take hold of this, that, that it's here and now, that, that it's not just salvation future, but it's salvation life now, right? To, to, to receive the grace that God has extended and then to allow that to be something that shapes the way that we live our lives in response to what God has done for us. Paul says this is a thing that's been part of our conversation as a people of God for a long, long time, but now we're starting to understand what this actually looks like. He says it's, it's for this moment, for the here and now. And then Paul describes his ministry and the ministry of those that have been traveling with him. Verse three, he says, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Paul is dealing with this tension that the, the church in Corinth seems to have with him, with, with the, the evidence of his life and the hardships and the suffering and all those things, and they're trying to reconcile that with this, this desire for an easier way forward. And Paul is describing what his life has looked like, the way that he's ministered. He's, he says, I've, I have been a good messenger. It doesn't mean the message is easy. Right? It doesn't mean that the message isn't going to create tension. It doesn't mean that the message isn't going to be offensive to, to the ways of the world. But Paul says, but I haven't been offensive. Which forces the Corinthian church, as they're listening to this letter, as they're listening to, to Paul's words in this moment, he's, he's forcing them to recognize that, that they're, not, they're not rejecting him. They're rejecting the message, the things that he has to say. He says, look, I have not created tension personally. I have not set up stumbling blocks. I've not, not, I've not operated in a way that, that, that's worthy of rejection. And yet, for some reason, you're distancing yourself from me. He says, it's, it's not about me. It was never about me. But there's something about my life that, that's causing you to pull away from me. So Paul's forcing them, just in the very way that, that he's approached life, that it's forcing them to look deeper at their reasons for pulling away from him. And then Paul continues. He starts to 
use his life, which is a dangerous thing for, for any communicators. We're talking about the, the journey and, and the way that God gets a hold of us. But, but Paul po- opens up his life that, and says, so, so this is what my life has looked like. Look at my life as the evidence of, of the way that this can play out as it, as it plays out and, and as we follow after God. Paul leverages his life as an example of receiving and living in the grace that God has extended. He says, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses. These are general statements of suffering, right? These are general statements of, of difficult moments along the way. But he starts with setting up a theme of endurance, saying, so, so before we talk about all the different ways that we're going to suffer and that I have suffered and all the different things that I've experienced, he says, so, so in great endurance, right? The thread that, that keeps me moving through all the kinds of things that I'm going to describe that I've experienced. In this stanza of of this letter that Paul's writing. You see, there are nine ways that he has suffered that he describes. They're really in groups of three. The first three, endurance, or in troubles, hardships, and distresses, are all general statements of suffering. Right? It's the, the sense that, that this is not right. These are categories of, of the kinds of suffering that someone may experience as the world has rejected them. But then it gets more specific. And then it gets more, with a more pointed experience that, that Paul's experienced. It says, verse 5, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots. That Paul is pointing not just to general statements of, of uncomfortable situations and, and unpleasant circumstances, but to specific moments and specific experiences along the way where he has been beaten. Right? Not just people haven't liked me or people have said unkind things to me, but I have been beaten. And he says, and, and I've been imprisoned. And I've experienced riots and pushback in the communities that I've, that I've gone into. These are concrete examples of specific events that in some ways have, have become regular occurrences in Paul's life as he sought to follow after what God has placed in front of him. Acts 20, we read it just a moment ago. Uh, verse 23, he says, I only know, he says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. But Paul says there are specific experiences of suffering that, that when life is laid down, when, when I say I'm going to live my life in response to what God has done for me, that, that these are the kinds of things I should expect to have happen. And, and, the, and the church in Corinth is, is looking at this and he's saying, look at my life. If you're trying to understand what you should expect as you follow Jesus, that if you've taken a hold of some sort of easier way or some sort of thing that, that isn't a result of, of gratitude for the grace that's been given you, then you're, you're missing the kinds of things. If you're following Jesus, then you shouldn't be surprised when he takes you to the same kinds of places that he, that he went himself through suffering and, and mistreatment and misunderstanding and all those kinds of things. He says, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, these three are more voluntary kinds of suffering. This is Paul saying, I may have preferences for how life should look. I may prefer to be hungry or prefer to be fed. I may prefer to have restful nights. I may prefer to to not have to to work quite so hard. He says, I I take on suffering. So it's not just what other people are doing to me and the way that people are treating me and this general sort of suffering or these specific kinds of things that have happened to me, but but there's the life laid down reality where I find myself working hard in sleepless nights and going hungry. And you put these two, the beatings, imprisonments, and riots, that category, and the voluntary suffering, the hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. You put those things together. And what Paul is describing really is the the understanding of the life lived in Christ that that seems to be part of what he's addressing as as something that's been missed by the church in Corinth. Where he's saying, so so you haven't, you've been trying to avoid these specific kinds of sufferings. You've been trying to avoid these unpleasant circumstances and the mistreatments and, and even the things that, that you've been taking hold of that, or letting go of, the, the, the hunger and the, and the sleep and all these kinds of things. It seems to reveal this version of salvation life that, that is eluding the Corinthian church up to this point. That Paul is trying to help them be reconciled, not just with himself, but to be reconciled with a way of living, this salvation life that they've been invited into, this this way of living that reflects the life that they're called to as followers of Jesus. So he's using his life as an example, saying, so this is what it has looked like for me as I've I've laid down my life and I've made decisions about the things that I'm going to value and then those values have have driven the way that I respond and the kinds of experiences that I've had. And in verse six, he talks and starts to talk about character, the inward expression of, of God's grace at work in his life. He says, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness. These are expressions of character. These are, these are inward transformation kinds of things. This is him saying impurity, not just, not just impure behavior, but pure in motive. 
Say, my life is, is oriented towards what God has for me. And, I, and I'm pure in the sense that, that my motivations and what drives me and the things that I'm taking hold of and the things that I value are, are driven by God's grace at work in my life. He says, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God. Which in this statement, this stanza, that there's this connection between statements where you have, you have sincere love and truthful speech. And Paul says, when God gets a hold of us, when God does this work in us and it starts to be expressed through us, when we realize the grace that's been extended and the fact that, that sometimes it's hard to, to speak the truth that's been placed in you. He says, so what we do is it's truth and love. But we, but we act, right? We do the thing that's uncomfortable. We, we live in sincere love and, and truthful speech that we, we love each other so much that we speak truthfully, even when it's hard even when it might create suffering, when it's going to create tension, when, when it might be offensive because it, it's contrary to the way that someone is living. And sincere love and truthful speech, and then the other pair is the Holy Spirit and the power of God. Linking the presence and leading of the Holy Spirit with the empowering work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Saying, so this is how it plays out to, to, speak, to speak truth in love, but to be driven by the Holy Spirit and to, to live in the power that God has as, as he works in us and through us. And then he describes the tools that he, that he goes about his life with, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. Paul saying, this is my approach to life and ministry. When, when, when all else fails or when, when, I, when I look and say, what tools do I have to work with? He says, I have weapons of righteousness and I take those in my right hand and in the left. And he says, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report. He says, there's going to be experiences on on both sides of the way that this is received, that people are going to see me in certain ways based on the, the way that they're responding to the message that I bring. That Paul says, I have the, the tools that I use, these weapons of righteousness in my right hand and left hand, but, but the results and the consequences of the work that I'm doing, that there is, there is a difference between the way they're received. That the Jesus message creates tension, that creates offense at times. He says, and so there's glory and there's good report. Right? There's there's glory there's, and there's good re- reputation. There's people that, that respond in a way that, that's a positive way. But he says, but then there's also dishonor and bad report. That Paul says, I've experienced both things. I think sometimes we look at, at life lived and we talk about suffering and we talk about following God and we talk about living our lives toward Jesus and we, and we think that it's only suffering. But Paul says, there are times when I get a front row seat of God getting a hold of somebody. I see the lights come on and, and I look and say, this, these are the moments that, that, that give such meaning to the ministry that I have. Where I see people be transformed, where God gets a hold of people and they live differently because of it. That, that I look and you say, so, so there's these moments of, of these mountaintop kinds of experiences. But he said, there's also moments when, when things don't go well. When my reputation suffers, when people reject me, when I experience hardships because of the, of the word that, that God has asked me to speak. And so here's the hard lesson for us. That you can have the right message, you can have the right approach, and still experience hardship and suffering. That getting it right doesn't mean that it's going to be simple. It doesn't mean that we're not going to suffer. Paul says you can get it right, you can have the right message and the approach, and still experience hardship and suffering. People may not like you. This is Paul just saying, this is my life lived and opening up and letting you see the way, this, the way this works out. People may not like you, but then we take endurance. And endurance says, but we press on anyway. Right? We keep moving, we keep trying, we keep striving, we keep allowing God to, to work in us and through us. We keep pressing on anyway instead of looking and saying, there's got to be an easier way. How do I live my life in a way that, that I don't experience rejection, where I don't experience hardship? And, and Paul says, the, the message and the, and the approach and all those things, it, it doesn't guarantee that you're not going to suffer. What, where we get off track is where we say, how do I keep myself from suffering? How do I go about this, this in an easier kind of way that doesn't create tension, that doesn't create offense? And Paul says, my, my goal is to run the race that's marked in front of me, to, to do everything I can to, to, to help the lights come on for people, but to recognize that it may not always go well. And so then Paul takes his life and he opens up for the Corinthian church and now for us 2,000 years later to understand the way this can play out. He, he describes his life through these paradoxical statements, these statements that seem like they're opposite terms, that, that, that they're in opposition to each other and yet you look and you follow his story, you follow his journey and you see that, that they, can, they can both be true at work in his life at the same time. These seemingly opposite terms but yet somehow true as people respond to him. 
This is Paul as he's describing the, the paradox situations that he walks through, that, that this is endurance despite the way that he's treated by others. That he's looking at his own life. He's helping the Corinthian church understand. He's helping us understand that, that his life doesn't make sense just because people think it makes sense. It makes sense because God is leading him through these paradoxes of this salvation life. He says in verse, the second part of verse 8, he says, I'm, I'm genuine, or we're genuine, yet regarded as imposters. We're genuine, yet regarded as imposters. He says, known, yet regarded as unknown. These statements that seem like they're opposite statements, but they can be true at the same time. That you can be genuine. Paul says, so we can operate in a genuine kind of way, and yet people can look at us and think that we're being fake. They think we're imposters. They can say all sorts of things, that people can say about us anything that they want to say about us. Both can be true. Known, yet regarded as unknown. Dying, and yet we live on. This is Paul saying, even earlier in chapter 4 and 5, where he talks about that death is at work in him, that that the the experiences of his life that that he's experienced in the body, that that there is death at work in him. And yet, and yet we live on. And yet we continue to move forward. He says, beaten, yet not killed. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. These things that feel like they're separate, but he's saying, so this is what life looks like, that, that there's both of these things that are at play in this. He said, if you only chase after the one, then, then you're not going to be fully faithful that the, the, the salvation, the grace that has been extended to you is not having a full effect in your life. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, yet possessing everything. These statements where Paul says, so, so this is the, the kinds of things, the kinds of tensions that exist in my life as I follow after God, that, that these are the things that, that mark life. And then he makes his appeal. In a pointed kind of way, he calls out the Corinthian church. He points to the Corinthian church and says, you have to make a decision about this. But at the same time, he's calling us to, to wrestle with these same kinds of questions. He says, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. He says, we are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As fair exchange, he said, I speak to you as my children, open wide your hearts also. That after Paul has made his case, after he's opened up his life and shared his experience and said, this is, these are the things that, that I've experienced as I've followed after God. Now you look on and you begin to get the, the, a glimpse into what God has done in me and what the world has done and the things that I've experienced. Paul says, Now I'm asking that you accept me. But I'm not just asking that you accept me. I'm asking that you accept the way of living that my life represents. I'm I'm asking you to to respond to God's grace, to to see what my life reveals about the way that God is at work in me. Paul says in his life, he says, "This this is grace received and salvation lived out. And so we're called. We're called to endurance, which is, which is more than just hunkering down and getting through difficult times. Right? The, the, the life that we're called to is more than just simply holding on and, and waiting for some future event. We're called to a way of living that takes us through the hard stuff, that takes us through the good and the bad and the paradoxes and, and all those kinds of things that, that we, we experience in life. It's more than just hunkering down and getting through. It's receiving grace from God and then living it out as we live towards the future. This is what salvation life looks like. So then the question is this, if endurance is living out the grace we've received, then what does that actually look like for us? And by way of a foundational statement as we make sense of of the calling that we have and the way that this should play out in our lives, that that we understand it to be this, that that grace received should impact the way we live. That that grace received should affect how life is lived. It should affect the decisions we make about what we're building our life on should affect the decisions we make about what we're living for, what we're holding on to, what what we're living toward, about how we live now. So on that foundation, grace received should affect how life is lived. We look and we say, so so what does endurance look like in this? We say that endurance connects the past, present, and future. That endurance becomes the thread that that holds these things together, where endurance says, so so God has done, and, and God will do. And we're called to, to live in this sort of way. And endurance says from, from the past, present, future, this is the thing that, that holds those together, that, that connects these, these moments. That faith and hope both address our relationship with the future. 
that faith and hope both talk about the, the things that, that are going to be, the things that have happened, but then, then move us towards the future. But, but now he's saying, so, so how do we get from the here and now to the future? And he says it's through endurance. It's through taking hold of, it's through making decisions about the way life is lived, that endurance builds on the past, that lives toward the future, but it shapes the way we experience the here and now, how we make sense of our experiences, how we make sense of, of the decisions that lie in front of us, how we make sense of, of the call that God has placed on us. So endurance connects the past, present, and future, and endurance is running our race. Endurance is not just hunkering down, it's not just getting through, it's not just impressing God with our persistence and our, and our strength and ability to, to go through hard things. Endurance says, this is the race that God has marked for us, and I'm going to run it. Right? There's a difference between simply enduring a hard set of circumstances and running a race that requires endurance. And Paul says, so, so we run, and so we push, and so we move forward, and so we allow God to do work in us that, that continues to, to, to shape the world as, as we move forward. Endurance is running our race regardless of circumstances, or maybe even embracing the hard stuff saying this is all part of the journey, this is all part of the race, this is, this is why it's endurance and not just simply going on a journey. It's embracing the hard stuff to the glory of God. And endurance reveals God's grace at work in us. That the way this plays out is that when we endure, it's not to give ourselves credit. Right? It's not to our glory, but it's to the glory of God. Because the way, the way this works is that endurance, when we go through things, when we look at our stories, when we look at, at the things that we've gone through and the things we've experienced, we look and we say, our endurance becomes our testimony. Because we go through things that, that are beyond ourselves, that are beyond our ability to persist, or beyond our ability to, to stay strong as we experience. And yet God carries us, and God keeps us moving forward, keeps us and, and, and cares for us as, as we move through these kinds of things. And so endurance becomes testimony. When we look and we say, so, so we went through these moments that we weren't sure how we were supposed to get through. And endurance, as our stories and our lives are lived in front of others, they become a testimony of God's work in us and through us. And at the same time, endurance is an act of worship as we remember with gratitude what God has done for us and help, as we move forward. It becomes an act of discipleship as we continue to learn, as God continues to, to shape us and help us to understand the, the way that we're called to live. Endurance reveals God's grace at work in us. And Paul, in, as this story plays out, as this letter is written, there's, there's three specific statements, these, these do this statements that, that show up in this letter, in this section of this letter. And the first one is this, is to receive grace with effect, not in vain. Right, this is our, us putting our own words to it. But it's, but it's Paul saying, so, so receive grace with effect, that it, that it should actually change your life. To not receive it in vain, that, that does not have effect, but it actually impacts you. There's two parts to this. One, the first is to receive grace, to recognize that there has been grace extended to you. So we receive it, not earn it, not, not figure out a way to leverage it or create some sort of transaction with God where, where he does for us what we hope he'll do for us but we receive grace, and then it changes us. Then it changes the way we act, the way that we operate, the, the decisions that we make, the things that we value, and how that lives out and, express, and is expressed into the world around us. To receive grace with effect is the, is, is the opposite of asymptomatic. Right? There is external evidence that, that there is grace at work in our lives, that our lives are different because God has gotten a hold, has gotten a hold of us, that grace changes the way we live. So, so Paul says, so so do this. Receive grace, but receive it in a way that, that changes you. It says, look at those who have gone before us. And this is where it's tricky for Paul because he talks about his own life. Right? He talks about the, his own way of living and the, and the, and the evidence that, that, that exists in the way that he's lived his life. But for some of us, this might be a good opportunity for us to talk to somebody that we perceive that is ahead of us on the journey, who's ahead of us on the journey. We look and we say, so there are a few steps ahead or a lot of steps ahead depending on how we understand our journey and their journey. We look and we, and maybe we spend some time with them and say, could you talk about the way that God has carried you? About the moments that required endurance? 
about the way that God has, has poured grace into your lives. This is part of the value of our small group environments where we begin to hear each other's stories. But, but for some of us, it would be valuable to say, I'm going to buy you a cup of coffee and I just want to ask you and, and hear the stories of, of the way that God has, has done this in you. To talk to someone who's ahead of you on the journey and then ask them simple questions about moments of endurance, about experiences of endurance, about the way that grace has affected their lives. Or maybe another option for saying to understand, look at those who have gone before us, to read the book of Acts, to read the story of the church lived in response to the work of Jesus Christ. And to read it not just as history, but as, as lives lived to the glory of God, saying we're going we're gonna to trust him, we're going to live our lives and make decisions based on, on the grace that has been poured out into our lives. And then we're encouraged and we're inspired to endure because others have gone before us and have done exactly that. Three, Paul says, open wide your hearts. Recognizing that ultimately this is not a behavior issue, this is a heart issue. He's not saying just act differently or try and put a veneer of, of, of holy kind of behavior in front of the, the life that you currently have. He says, let's talk about hearts. Let's talk about the condition of our hearts that would, that would suggest that, that we're going to make decisions based on what might seem like it's easier, what might require nothing of us. And he says, so, so open your hearts to my story. Open your hearts to, to what God is showing you about what life should look like based on the evidence of, of what's happened in my life. He says, so open your hearts. Paul, to put it in our own words, he says, so, so you're rejecting me. Or to take the whole of this, this story, he says, you're rejecting me because you're rejecting the call to run with endurance. He says, my life is evidence to the way that God calls and leads us. He says, you're rejecting with your heart. This is a, a summary of the conversation with, with the church in Corinth through this part of, the, of Scripture. He says, you're rejecting with your heart and only embracing the surface benefits of grace. That We, we want to feel like we've received grace. He says, you're wanting just the surface benefits of it without the actual expression of it into the way that you live your life. That you're trying to figure out how you can get some sort of grace that requires nothing of you. He says, and yet the journey that's, li- that, that's in front of you, the call to, to endurance and to, to, to have past, present, and future lived for the glory of God, that, that is going to require something. There's not an easy way in this. He says, it's the way that I have lived and it's the way that you're called to live as well. So open your hearts.